So yeah, before we do anything, let let me give you the homework one and give it back to you. Some manner issues. I have the solution, but I haven't posted it yet. I, I will post it to the, to the website very soon. <clears throat> so let's take a look at the, the main problems here. So for the first one, what's the peak voltage of the rectified output? So that's VM, right? Is that VM? VM at where? Here. In that case, here's a quick question, okay? A really a common sense or quick quiz question. So 120 volts is uh, RMS. Can you see that RMS on the oscilloscope? So we, which are seeing on the oscilloscope? A sound wave swing from peak to peak. That's a real voltage signal. So the RMS is not something you can see on the oscilloscope. It's calculated by the by the uh, the average equation we derived in the class. Right, the integration and the average, right? So it's not something you can see physically on the oscilloscope. But however, uh, so the 120 volts is something you couldn't see, but you can calculate back to find out the VM, okay? So 10 to one, and you, you are going to know that the uh, RMS here will be, so you can do that sooner or later, it doesn't matter because it's multiplication or division. That doesn't matter, but after you, after or before um, you calculate the VM, after or before that minus that 0 0.7 matters. It's not pure multiplication or division since you have a, a minus two times 0 0.7 in there. So to be clear, understand what's going on. So 120 is our mass, and I know exactly here the RMS will be 12. So you can do that. Before you go any further, you know here RMS will be 12. Or you can do this. I'm going to use this 120 to calculate the VM. And then calculate the VM here. Are you going to get the same result? No, I mean, before you move further, okay, just do not look at here, this part. Let's do this. 120 is RMS, okay? Let's start with this one. 120 divided by 10 is 12 times square two, square root of two, is a VM between these two terminals, okay? That's the first mass. Another one is you divide this RMS by 10 first and then times square root of two. It's the same result. Okay, so you are, anyway, you are getting a VM between these two terminals. So now we know the VM. Because we know VM will be the VM, uh, will be something I can see on the oscilloscope. And also I know that there will be a two times 0 0.7 volts drop from here to here. So I can calculate the VM here. All right, so we got a VM here which means you can, if you connect this part to the third scope, you'll see a sine wave with a VM, which is VM here minus two times 0 0.7. And use that oscilloscope wave, uh, use that sine wave you can see on the oscilloscope to calculate, no, you are done for the A. So A is done, that's, that's it, that's for A, right? 
So that's the peak voltage for the rectified output, which is 12 here times square root of 2 minus 2 times 0 0.7. Is that correct? Okay, so A is done. Derive the rectification efficiency of the full wave bridge rectifier and ignore the diode voltage drop. So now it's just exactly what I did in the class. And what's the peak? Do not ignore the diode voltage drop. What's the peak? That's a VM minus one times 0 0.7. And that's it. You're done for the first one. For the second one, the following full wave center typed rectifier, find the rectified DC output. What is that? VAV, right? So whenever you see, find the looking for the rectified DC voltage output. That means VAV. Just remember that. And <clears throat> now let's take a look. Here is 110. RMS, okay? So what's RMS here? 5.5. .5. Because 110, then you got a total of 11 here. So 5.5 .5 here for RMS. And that's just RMS. That's not a real voltage, right? So you want to calculate for VM first before you uh, minus that one by 0 0.7. So times Square root of 2, you got a VM, and minus 0 0.7, you got a VL. But that's a VM for the VL. Then you need to use 2 times VM over pi to get VAV. Okay? That's for the second problem. And this one. Still VAV, rectified DC voltage output, still VAV. Okay, I have been mentioning this in the class for a few times. VAV, which is a DC voltage output. And you know this, you know this. Let's see what's the VAV here. 11, no, so this is 110. And this will be 11, which is our mass. So times square root of 2. You got a VM. And VM minus 2 times 0 0.7, you got a VM over V out. So that's the peak voltage of the V out. And since you know that's going to be the peak voltage, the peak voltage you can see on the oscilloscope, that's a real voltage, actually, physically. And calculate the VAV, which is 2 times VM over pi. I know you have forgot it since I covered this on the first week. This is the third week in the semester. It's long enough to let you forget everything. This is recorded, so never mind. I'm going to post the uh, video to the website when you are reworking on your homework assignment, you know, to re revise it. Um, you have all these references, so it shouldn't be a big deal. And B. So the equation, just use the equation, right? So that's uh, I load, I load over Fc equals to ripple voltage. And now the ripple voltage is, is given. So the C will be I over Fv. And F should be two times 60, 60 hertz because this is 120 hertz now. And Ripple voltage is given, so what is I load? I load is IAV. You need to calculate for VAV first and use VAV over RL. That's it. You got IAV on the top and over FV equals to C. All right. Imagine if we have all this kind of problem for the entire semester, what would you think? <laughs> Drop the class. <laughs> yeah.
I know I used to be a student as well. I hate this kind of problem as well. So I understand that. So set up some short-term goals. Have some long-term goals and set up some short-term goals. So all these um, courses or homework assignments you don't really like uh, won't really bother you since you just want to get it done as soon as possible so you can enjoy something else, uh, which serves your short-term goal. Right? Um, for example, get a good internship, earn $27, get a new car, you know, get a job, all these things. So what's the long-term goal, you think? Do you have long-term goal? Any idea? Zane? No? Scott? I really want to do something positive for me. So I'm from Murray Hall, so I'm going to walk around Murray Hall. That's my main goal. That's great. Yeah, I like that. I, I used to have the similar idea. When I was in my graduate school, there was one undergrad student came over. Uh, when we were working on the labs, he also should do the lab. And before he left, he said, yeah, I know this is important, but I know what I'm thinking is, if I can buy 10 houses and rent it out, I just collect a rent for every month, then I'm done for my life. <laughs> That's what he said. But before that, you need enough money to buy that 10 properties. <laughs> yeah, everybody should have your long-term goal and short-term goals as well. Trevor, you have any long-term goal? What's that? Great, yeah. And hire somebody to come over to you know work on software projects, right? Things like that. And if that's a really good innovation, probably can attract a lot of investments from other people, right? And the company can grow. Great. Jesse? Yeah. James? <laughs> you probably wanna be a uh, the principal engineer or principal scientist in, in some of the companies that are paying you 300,000 bucks a, a year and, and you don't have to do all these detailed things, just hire all these young people come over. Great. My long-term goal is I don't have to work so much, but I can earn a lot. That's my long-term goal. <laughs> All right, so let's continue working on this one. I think we were here. RFID. I think this will be the last lecture where I'm going to cover all these sensors and actuators in any type of locations, interfaced with uh, microcontrollers, any com computer boards, any of these things. So RFID, you have been using this pretty much every day. If you have a sky card, if you are going to spy, swipe on the door and uh, get access to the lab, right? So you are scanning this all the time. Um, so do you know how that works? Any idea? Since this is in your everyday life, you're checking in the hotel, check out all these things. And the counter, so, so they just take your card. So everybody can use that, the same card, but get access, access to different rooms. And before they do that, the person has to program it first, right? So they have a little machine on the table. They put your card on there and blah, 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 and program it. So that card has a specific, special code just for that room, no other room. Um, but how that works. So it's pretty interesting. Um, there are several types of RFIDs, but I think the most common one is when you're reading that one. So I'm going to tell you. So the ID itself has an integrated circuit chip inside, it's a digital chip, and also has a coil. So whenever you put your card close to the scanner, the reader, and the reader is going to emit that RF signal and power up 
your car because the car has a coil which can receive that signal and convert it into a voltage signal and power up the IC chip inside the car. And then they will start a communication because it, it can just be thinking about it's a specific type of protocol like I2C spy, something like that, but it's being communicated in, in a wireless uh, per, uh, manner. And but the, the car itself doesn't have a battery, keep in mind. It uses that wireless signal to power it up uh, and then start a communication. Yeah. And how do you program it? How do you program the car? So you need a, a little machine. It can be a reader, it can be a programmer, but it's communicating with the car wirelessly, right? So place the card onto that reader or programmer. So that one will continuously sending that wired signal to power up your car. So car, so whatever circuit inside the card is actually running during that time. Okay. And there must be a call, right? So you can start opening, uh, starting that that talk, that communication. And you can assign a specific code into the, to the memory, sent to the memory of the chip inside, inside the car. So the car, the, the specific uh, passcode being stored in the memory of the, of the card can be changed or programmed. That's why every time you can change it and can use that one for a different uh, hotel room. That's how that works. And there is a pretty interesting Arduino kit. So the Arduino, Alago Arduino kit, we I, I bought it for you. It doesn't have that thing uh, because the box I, I gave to you is thirty nine dollars. If you want to include that one, it can be fifty something dollars. And we don't have that experiment to be included into any of the tutorials. So I can probably include include that one in the future. And you know, I was thinking about this one th uh, today. There are so many other interesting applications you can you can play with using your Arduino or any other microcontrollers. We just don't have the time to cover everything in one semester. So like RFID, you can create a little uh, door latch, see here. So it's controlled by servo motor. <laughs> you, you, you scan on that, and if it detects the correct passcode, you can trigger that uh, servo motor and turn on the latch, open the door. Um, something like that. And you can buy a kit like this to program your car. So what you'll do is actually connect everything to your Arduino Nano or Uno, doesn't matter, and place this RFID on the top of this module and program it. And if you have this, this kind of kit, you can even develop a product, you can sell it, seriously. Because when we uh, when we submit the request, there's a time frame. Uh, it's one exact year. So so the person working in the Skycar office, they will put that specific code into the uh, into the car. I don't know how, how they program, but there will be a specific code just for that time frame. And that's that's how that works. Is that, is that your question? They can use different types of code, right? Like to represent different information. Uh, I don't know what they use, but you can, if you are designing this, you can even make it work. It's not really hard. So here's a wireless charger you can actually buy from DigiKey or from anywhere. If you do a search, wireless charger, you can buy one. And so the wireless charger can be directly connect to your, connected to your LiPo battery. If you have a robot or a toy you are working with, uh, you want to make it wearable or portable, uh, you can actually make it uh, charge it wirelessly. And you don't have to design everything by yourself. You can just buy the coil, and the charger, and the battery by yourself. Uh, so there's a pretty interesting robot I worked with the middle school kids in, the, in the, this summer. 
uh, it's called Spiral Bolt. It's pretty much a, a little bit over a hundred bucks per bolt. <laughs> and uh, the user is not going to open up the bolt at all. Uh, there's no switch outside of the bolt. I mean, I'll have some videos to show you. So uh, the first time you see this kind of toy, it's kind of it's magic. You, but if you are if you are a computer engineering student or background, you should be able to understand it. But other people probably they won't. <laughs> so if you have kids in the future, buy them one of these. They can start playing with this one starting from middle school, and they so it has a. Uh, graphical user interface uh, for programming. So if they don't understand how to assign variables, you know, all these data types, they can use that one to program. So they can practice the programming uh, concepts or uh, skills when they are just over 10 years old. open up this robot. Everything's enclosed inside. And you must be wondering how do you turn it on, how to turn it off, how do you charge it up? It has a battery inside. And if there's some something going wrong, how to fix it? So for the last question, how to fix it? The answer is you cannot fix it. <laughs> but for all the other questions, you don't have to open it up. Uh, you charge it wirelessly first. And whenever the charger receives that wireless signal, it's going to turn, it's going to trigger that microcontroller to turn it on. Uh, get out the uh, motor, the power saving mode. Probably Jesse has been working on that in the summer. So you can program your microcontroller to let it work in the power saving mode. So how that works? Here's my question. So it has four motors, two, okay, two, not four, two motors inside. And whenever the motor rolls, it changes the center of gravity of the bolt. And so it's going to roll forward or backward or left or right. Oh, that's how that works. It's so like a hamster in the bolt, like this. Okay? So keep rolling, and uh, it seems like when so there is a, a mechanism on the charger, so we can choose to power it off, right, or turn it off, totally. But however, I don't I don't believe it's totally off. Uh, I think the the mic controller is still running, waiting for that signal, and but in the super power saving mode. And whenever the wireless charger, um, whenever the, the bolt is close enough to the wireless charger, it's going to be turned on. So you will be able to detect your the robot from your smartphone because you have an app in your smartphone. And you have to turn on the Bluetooth function. And you'll be able to see how many or which robot is close to you. So you can turn it on, turn it off from the Bluetooth. But if you are controlling from the Bluetooth, have to think about it, and I'm I'm controlling that wire, that that guy wirelessly from Bluetooth, which means the mic controller inside has to be on. <laughs> right, it has to keep receiving the wireless sig the Bluetooth signal from the Bluetooth module, normally from UART. Right, just keep detecting if there's anything coming, but in a really power saving mode. Otherwise, if, if everything is off, do you think you can still see that signal bar on your smartphone? No, it's not sending signal out. Okay. Uh, it is able to stay, the, the battery is still alive for uh, more than a month, I guess. Uh, 
without being activated, just in the power saving mode, uh, which is pretty good, I think. Um, it, I, I think it's, it's a really good toy for kids. So that's one of the really good examples for wireless charging. So the user will never touch anything inside, especially for kids. And this is what they really want to uh, that happen because you know kids will mess up with all everything inside. So uh, it's a good design. I like it a lot. Okay. Then temperature. I will skip some of the slides since we have been uh, we have had a, some review for temperature sensors. So here is one. That's a mechanical uh, switch, but sensing temperature and changes the mechanical. Um, there will some deflection will be will happen for that material. So look at here. Uh, if you heat it up, it will be deformed and open the switch. Otherwise, it's going to close the switch and let the current flow through it. So, which means cold, when it's too cold, I want to turn it on. When it's too hot, I want to turn it off. Right? Have you ever seen this kind of mechanical switch somewhere? It's called thermostat. I don't think this guy deserves that name, thermostat. Uh, it's just a mechanical switch, which senses uh, temperature. So uh, this is the one I took out from my freezer last year. And uh, since my freezer started collecting all the frost, uh, and I don't know why, I was trying to replace the seal, the rubber seal of the gasket, actually it's the gasket of the uh, of the freezer and it didn't work. And I was thinking if there anything else is wrong inside, uh, the temperature sensor is not working or maybe the heater is not working. And I, by that time, I didn't know there's a heater in the freezer. Do you know there's a heater in the freezer? No, the heater is, is actually, it's gonna turn super hot. And that's a little bit against your concept about the freezer. Because if you put a, put a heater in the freezer, probably all your food will, will thaw, right? It, it won't be frozen. But actually, it's not affecting that much. So there's a heater at the bottom of the freezer on the back. And uh, it's not being turned on really often. So whenever there are too much frost being built in the freezer, it's going to trigger, keep in mind, too much frost. frost. What does that mean? It's, it's going to be too cold, right? In that, in that region, in that specific area. So it's going to be cold. Too cold. It's too cold. Turn on the switch. Turn on the heater. And heat it up. And so the, all the ice build up in the, in the freezer. Uh, otherwise, open the switch and uh, turn off the heater. So here's a mechanical switch. It will be turned on, turned off all the time. And I believe probably nobody has uh, replaced that since the house was built in 2005, I guess. It'll be 15 years on and off mechanically. So I saw a bump on the switch. So I, I know it must be that this guy's issue. And I bought one, replaced it, and start working again. Uh, and which I think saved me $1,000 if I ask somebody to come over to fix it especially in, in Durango. <laughs> I had some experience with that, with my HVAC. Ask a person to replace the motor in the HVAC and he asked for 700 bucks for three hours. Um, so I will never, I'm gonna try to fix everything by myself if I can. <laughs> so here's the heater. Uh, as you can see, this is on the, on the back of the freezer and the heater is just underneath this, uh, I don't know what is this. I think they are the heat sink. Actually, it's not a heat sink. It's a, um, 
I don't know. I don't know what is that, but it's it's building a lot of ice on the surface, and so the heater will not be turned on because of the uh, the fridge is broken. And I was also trying to detect if this guy is broken or not because you can imagine it's a low resistance heater, and every time you turn it on, there will be a lot of current run through this this heater. It it's just a resistor, but pretty low resistance. So you, when you run voltage across it, there are a lot of current runs through it, so heat it up. That's it. And I was thinking probably it's burned down because so much current for 15 years. And so there's a way to detect that really quickly. Uh, you just grab a multimeter to detect the resistance on the two terminals. If it's in, within, the, I forgot, like 20 or oh, 10 to 100 ohm, then which means it's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. Uh, if you see a uh, hundred mega ohms, <laughs> it's a disconnect circuit. So which means it's it's burned down already. You want to replace that one. So I do a, I did a detection and I didn't see any large resistance. So I know this is fine. So I didn't order a new one. So I just ordered uh, the mechanical switch, and luckily it worked. So that's the only problem in the freezer. Thermistor, thermal resistor. You have one of these in your box, and uh, there's a tutorial to follow how to play around with it. So here's the equation. So the equation came from the material itself. Um, the background of that equation is uh, from physics, and definitely we are not going to derive any of that equations. And it's given already in the kit. So when you are trying to use a thermistor, you connect that one to your analog input of the Arduino and just use the equation they gave to you. Just use it. Okay. Pretty simple. If you look at the circuit, super simple. And here's the equation I want to use. Okay. But not derive it. I'm not going to ask you to derive it. Nobody wanna derive it. And why? No, I don't I don't even know. Use it. That's a material science. Okay? Thermocouple we have mentioned a couple of times. And now the DHT11, DHT22. So this sensor has been super popular, especially in the Arduino kit you have. And a lot of people who are all these uh, uh, designers or uh, hikers for embedded systems, they have been working with, you know, play around with this sensor for, for a long time. And so it, it is able to detect the temperature and humidity at the same time. So make this guy a lot more powerful than the other types of temperature sensors. And you know, what's inside to sense the temperature is nothing but a thermistor. It's exactly the same thermistor you have in the Arduino box. This guy. That's it. That's a temperature sensor part, okay? What about the humidity sensor? There are not too many humidity sensors available on the market, keep in mind. Doesn't like temperature, so common everywhere, all different types, analog, digital, anything, right? But for, for humidity, especially for, for the really accurate humidity sensors, not too many options available. And But I think this one has made it a really low cost and effective. And popular as well because it's cheap and it's working it, it's not super accurate but I think it's good enough to to play with so the the humidity sensor inside is something like this it has different layers of materials and see the what's the material salt or conductive plastic polymer so whenever humidity changes the resistance of that material will change. So it's detecting the resistance change to calculate back for humidity. Okay. So that's the sensor. So you know there is something you can detect the temperature and humidity at the same time. It's just in your box. Look at this one. That's another temperature sensor. What's the company? 
analog devices. This company bought which company? Linear technology. Yes, that is right. Who bought Arduino? <laughs> yeah, I'm asking, right? It must be be one. Must be one. Maximum? No. Do you know microchip? Yeah. Yeah, microchip. So look at this logo. Seal this in your mind, microchip. That used to be number one company in in the, in the market on the market to uh, design all these microcontrollers. Uh, I think it's still number one by far. Um, so all these PIC microcontrollers you saw in the old uh, P PCR machine. So. PIC, right? So it's called PIC, my controllers, from 8 bit, 16 bit, 16 bit, 32 bit, all these different types of my controllers uh, used to be super popular in, in the past. Uh, but most recently, Arduino got more popular because it's super easy to use. And so many developers are making all these open source libraries. So microchips think, hey, I'm going to buy you <laughs> since you are going to be number one instead of myself. So microchip just bought uh, at Mega a couple of years ago. So our Arduino belongs to this company now. And they are still making really good DSP, uh, digital signal processing microchips, and also including the LoRa uh, chips as well. They, they have really good solutions for all these LoRa modules. Uh, low power and uh, highly integrated, plus a really powerful microcontroller inside the same chip. Uh, industrial level, we just probably were not using that too much for, for now. But in the future, if you are working for a company developing all these embodied systems, maybe you'll get a chance to, to work with the microchips. Yeah, so this one, what's the signal output? So you have you have this in your box. And if you're, you are in uh, 315, you have played with this one in the spring. So this temperature sensor is, looks like the DS1820, uh, but the output is one wire, yes. It has a, VCC has a ground, but the one wire is providing a analog signal keep in mind analog not digital it's analog voltage and there's an equation provided in the data sheet just follow the equation and program your microcontroller to get the convert it convert the analog signal into a digital voltage a digital temperature signal so here's the equation it's actually provided in the in their data sheet and you don't need to ask why, because just use it. That's what they are asking you to do. OK, keep in mind, so this temp this sensor, TMP36, okay, it's an analog output. So what about this one, DS18B20? I still remember, I think this sensor launched in the time somewhere around 2005 summer around that year and <clears throat> that was a hit because it's just one wire and the digital compared to this guy it's a lot better because this guy you still have you still need IDC this one doesn't even need IDC is that significant you know ADC has a lot of op amps in the chip, and you know OPAMPS takes place, it takes uh, takes space on, on, on the chip. So 
uh, if you are not using ADC, which use a lot of OPAM inside, you are going to save a lot of space inside the chip. That's why this one was really uh, good news for all these uh, designers. Uh, it's a one wire digital output, has its own protocol. And there's an Arduino library called one wire you can directly use. Three wires in total, so ground power and digital signal output. Um, it's a semester, it's analog, the DHT. Uh, I don't know which one, which one? So what is that pin? I don't know what is that pin. Oh yeah, got you. So yeah, the sensor itself has IDC inside. If you look at the data, Yeah, I don't think it's just a uh, just a semester. It must be have must have some digital signal in digital digital circuit inside. He has a no connection. I don't know what that one is doing. They just have four pins. Just not using that pin. Probably it's for per, for you know repairing. I don't know. Yeah, you can you can imagine that it's just one just one wire for data, and for both temperature and humidity, how that works? It's, it won't work. It must be a digital signal. Uh, so it must be a package, right? So follow their own protocol. So the digital circuit inside is sending out the package. So the first, I don't know, so eight bits will be temperature. The second eight bits will be humidity. And there must be one bit in the middle to separate them, saying, I'm done with the temperature, then do humidity. Something like that. Yeah, this is trying to make it easier to use, just one wire for data. But there must be some uh, digital circuit inside. So this is Jesse's work in the summer. And somebody can put the D. Uh, okay, so here's another question. Which company made this sensor? Is there a company like that? <laughs> it's just create a name. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, what's a short, uh, what's the name of this? Uh, so AD, right? So AD. So this is DS means uh, Dallas Semiconductor. It's another company in Texas. Uh, so they have made a lot of uh, good products as well. DS, whenever you see DS, you know it's Dallas Semiconductor. Okay. Um, so they can seal this one into a probe like this. So it's waterproof. They can use this one to measure the temperature of the water. You are going to use this one for your microcontroller project, right? It's going on right now. It's going to do in one month, four weeks. Do it early. Don't wait until the very last week. <laughs> um, so here's this, here one thing. So you can buy all these cables since I already put the DS1820. 18B20, sometimes 1820. I think 1820 was the name 15 years ago. They had a B in, in the middle, probably it's the updated version. Uh, so 1820, okay. So 1820, uh, you can buy a sensor probe with a cable, like six feet cable. Uh, so you can mirror that uh, from six feet from the water um, surface. Uh, but if you have, if you need a relatively longer distance, you can extend the cable using the Ethernet cable. What Ethernet cable? Uh, 
I've ever thought about it. Why not just buy the wires and use the tapes, bond them together, and just use the regular wires? Yeah, so it has some special structure inside to decrease the parasitic capacity of the cable. Because cable, the core of the cable is metal, and it have a rubber or plastic around the metal, so for, which forms capacitance along the cable. There are so many capacitors on the cable, and they're in parallel. You can draw all these virtual capacitors. They are not real capacitors, but they are capacitors. And which means you will have a huge capacitor along the cable, especially for long distance transmission. So which means your bandwidth will be affected. So what's the bandwidth? The speed of your signal, okay? Because you have a huge capacitor, and you can imagine if you are trying to charge up and discharge the capacitor, which takes time. It's like a huge bucket. You are fill, refill and uh, pump out or drain the bucket. If you have a huge bucket, you have a limitation for doing this quickly. You couldn't do that quickly. You have a tiny amount, a tiny cup. You can charge and discharge this quickly. So a huge capacitance will affect the bandwidth and you are not able to charge and discharge the capacitor quickly, which means you cannot oscillate your cable quickly, use a digital signal. And you can imagine for any digital signal is being sent as a temperature data through the cable, at least it's like a few thousand hertz a second. Imagine you have a huge cap and you want to oscillate that cap a thousand times, a few thousand times a second. It's hard. So you need a relatively lower capacitance to achieve high speed or higher uh, bandwidth. So that's why they that's why they use Ethernet cable instead of other normal cables for internet connection. You can see the Ethernet cable can be pretty long. You have, have seen that some places. They can be like around the room and so outside a couple hundred feet, right? That's the reason why you want to use Ethernet cable instead of regular cables for digital signal transmission. And the same concept, you can use the Ethernet cable to extend your temperatures, the DS1820 is temperature probe uh, to send a signal to uh, what I what I found online, uh, arguably 100 meters. Uh, that's what I heard. I haven't tried 100 meters, but I think I tried what I put here. I think somewhere around 50, 55 meters. I, I tried it and it worked. I didn't try longer distance, but 55 meters worked really well. So the signal is not missing any data, it's uh, the correct value of temperature, no problem at all. And you must be thinking uh, which wire to be connected to which wire inside the cable. Since there are how many? Six? Eight? Yeah, eight, four pairs. Eight cables inside. Does that matter which one you, you want to use? They are just metal wires with a, a wire with a metal metal core. And if you pick up three wires like um, green, blue, red, for example, for to be connected to your DS1820 on one side. So the other side, which is being connected to the PCB board, you just cut off all the other wires, just leave the green, blue, and red shorted to your board. That's it. Uh, possibly I can give you a chance to crimp, crimple, a crimple tool, use a crimple tool to make a, to, to grab a header and uh, customize the Ethernet cable uh, in the C, no, C351 in the Mac controller class. Um, hopefully we get a chance to do that. I have the cable, I have the tools, I have everything. Just try it. It's pretty simple. You can learn this in 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Have you done that before, Trevor? Yeah. Here's another temperature sensor. So this guy can sense both temperature and pressure. 
So compared to the DHT, this guy, this guy can do something different. Um, but also, it's a very good one. It's highly integrated, small, and digital. What's the protocol? I2C. What are the two pins for I2C? This one, uh, it has a IR receiver inside. So depends on the temperature of the object, it receives a different signal intensity. It's a non-contact infrared thermometer. Okay. This is all the temperature sensing options. Actuators, switches, these are easy, motors, we all know what's the difference between the brushless motor and brush motor, brush the motor. So one quick question, brush, brushless motor and the brushed motor. Um, so there are DC motors, and the difference is here. Here's a brush. But before you try to understand what's going on here, you probably want to know how, how the DC motor works, like this. So that's a brush, the DC motor. So the brush, the DC motor, is a motor you have been using in your circuit one class, the cheap one, low cost. So there's a, a magnet, okay, so NS, north and south. And there's a coil, so it's pretty simple, it's just running a, a electrical current in the coil. So for example, the current runs in one direction at the very beginning, and it's gonna generate a magnetic field. And for example, the field is south and north, north, no, no, north and south. So the magnet is north, is NS, okay? So the magnetic field created by the current is also NS, same direction. So what's going to happen? It's going to push it because N is trying to come to the south S part. But it's S is going to the N part. So it's rotating. So what, because it, it has a mass, right? So it's going to have an inertia. Uh, whenever it rotates, it won't stop whenever it arrives at that location. It's gonna go a little bit beyond that. So the current here, because the brush has two terminals, since this guy rotates, so the direction of the current will change as well. So after the current direction changes, the polarity of, the, uh, of this coil will change as well. So it's gonna keep going, keep going, keep going like this. So the thing is, whenever the, rotation, the, the rotor is rotating, uh, it has to keep the connection between the rotor and the brush, the connector. So it has a mechanical connection or friction. So it will wear out after a specific uh, amount of time. So it has a relatively shorter uh, life expectancy or less fun. Okay? So that's why the uh, brush the brushless DC motor is a little bit better. It's also a little bit more expensive as well. And so the way that works is, if you look at the image here, it's something like this. Okay, so this is just trying to let you understand what's going on in there. So this is pretty more clear to see what's inside. So that's the rotor. That's a stator. And the circuit is going to energize every stator uh, sequentially. So it's gonna drive the rotor uh, to rotate later on. Um, but there's no brush because there's no contact. It's just directly using uh, the electrical signal to energize every magnetic one by one. So uh, to change the part, the direction of the magnetic field. So the rotor will be attracted in that direction, sequentially. 
and the thermal motor i have a lot and you oh i didn't put in the box but if you we don't have any project to work on that so never mind um uh, here's one thing keep in mind uh just need to know the servo motor has dc motor inside so normally it's a brushed dc motor and it has a feedback circuit inside to control the position of the servo motor it doesn't like the dc motor you have been using your circuit one you part it up it's going to rotate but you don't know how much it just rotated but for servo motor you can specific what's the degree what's the angle i need that motor to rotate you can quantify that relatively accurate okay dc motor speed control normally pwm right you have been you have done that in the past um stepper motor and you have enough chance to work with stepper motor in the future um piezo uh, vibration convert vibration into voltage so the ultrasound machine in the in the hospital receive the echo because it's a 3d structure inside so uh, different uh, parts of the patient will of the organ will echo a signal with a different intensity because they have a different distance between the organ and the, the transducer so in that case you can form you can reconstruct the image uh, by the uh, voltage voltage difference being received by the transducer. That's how that works. It's a piezo. It's a piezo um, device. Okay. And buzzer is also a piezo device. It converts the voltage vibration into mechanical vibration and uh, create the sounds. And here is a piezo motor We're running over time we still have a couple of slides i can do it next time but probably just taking five to ten minutes on friday and then we'll start working with uh get an introduction to the balance the car you probably need to do first you have a copy mm -hmm. you do if you don't you can pick up this one later i don't know what it is so it's two or three Thank you. 